No other wild habitat on Earth feeds more people than the ocean. Yet 85% of global fish stocks are now overfished or fully depleted. There's no place for marine life to hide, even in an environment as large as the ocean. In the face of this sobering reality is a small but growing movement of fishermen, consumers, retailers, and chefs who are choosing the least deadliest catch. Hey everyone, I'm Tyler. And this is my younger brother, Alex. And together, we're the Water Brothers. We're gonna take you on an adventure around the world to explore the state of our blue planet, a planet defined by water and its ability to sustain life. So join us on our journey as we explore the world, looking at the most important water stories of our time. And together, we will learn how to better protect our most precious resource. Overfishing has decimated marine ecosystems around the world. We have simply become too good at industrialized fishing with little thought of sustainability. We are losing a critical food source that sustains billions of people. With fish populations crashing, it's more important than ever to understand the impact of the seafood choices we make. Do you know where the seafood you're buying came from or how it was caught? It turns out your choices really do matter. And if there is one part of the world all too familiar with the problems caused by overfishing, it is Atlantic Canada. For hundreds of years, Canada's east coast was the heart of the Atlantic cod fishery, one of the most bountiful fish stocks the world has ever known. But starting in the mid 20th century, fishing practices modernized. The traditional method of hook and line fishing was replaced by industrial fleets of foreign and Canadian draggers. These boats, also known as bottom trawlers, drag massive nets along the ocean floor, scooping up everything in their path. Bottom trawling kills indiscriminately, ruining the bottom habitat and catching a high number of species unintentionally, known as bycatch. A species that helped support coastal communities for over 500 years and in many ways helped establish Canada as a nation was wiped out. In 1992, the Canadian government realized that the only way to save cod from extinction was to put a moratorium on all large-scale commercial fishing. Over 20 years later, the ban remains, and it's still unknown whether the cod stocks will ever rebound. In a small cove just west of Halifax, Nova Scotia, the impacts can still be seen today. Overfishing has completely changed the ecological balance of marine ecosystems throughout the Maritimes and really across the entire North Atlantic. Uh, but one of the only ways to see this change is to get into the water yourself. So today we're going to go diving, we're going to film any life that we can see and compare it to footage of this exact spot from over 20 years ago to see just how drastic some of this change has been. Joining us were marine scientists Dr. Boris Worm and Dr. Chris Harvey-Clark. Dr. Clark has been diving and filming at this location for over two decades, documenting changes to the ecosystem. Hiding between the rocks and kelp were countless numbers of lobsters and crabs. At first glance, these waters seemed perfectly healthy, but it soon became apparent that something was missing, large fish. When I go diving here, it just makes me sad because you see an ecosystem that has completely changed. It's unrecognizable from what it was before. And maybe more importantly, only a few people know about this. It used to be entirely different. On an average dive, you would see probably four to six of the big Atlantic wolf fish, which are primarily a predator of invertebrates, slow growing along with. On a good day, you'd see 40 or 50 ocean pout. You'd see dozens of large sculpins. So I was here before, and it's been like this for the last 15 years. Even though the cod moratorium was already in place when Dr. Clark first filmed here, bottom trawling has never stopped, and species like the wolf fish have suffered severe population declines from bycatch, 
often thrown back, already dead. Imagine you're on the Serengeti and you're pulling a huge net across the Serengeti with helicopters, you know, <laughs> scooping up lions and zebras and gazelles and giraffes and elephants and rhinos and everybody in one swoop, right? And then you're eating, say, the gazelles because they're the tastiest and everybody else gets discarded. We understand that that's not a good idea. We also understand that at the same time, if you're uprooting the trees and you're damaging the prairie, that would also be bad news for the replenishment of those gazelles you're primarily interested in, right? So I think that's a metaphor for what trawling often does to ecosystems. Bottom trawling does not just take too many fish, it also damages the entire seafloor ecosystem. The lobsters are there because we destroyed their predators, like large cod, wolfish, other larger species that used to be very plentiful here in the inshore ecosystem, and they're not anymore. Lobsters have become so abundant, they are commonly seen in habitats where they were once never found, like in the sand flats, where they would normally be easy prey. The concern we have is that those fisheries more and more rely on a single species. And this is a risky strategy because if anything happens to that species because of climate change, because of disease, we've seen this happen in New England, for example, where lobster stocks were wiped out in Rhode Island due to a disease, this will hit this province and all of Atlantic Canada very hard because it's the one species that remains. And while it's lucrative, um, it's a risky strategy to rely on just one species in the ecosystem. Despite evidence linking bottom trawling to the collapse of the Atlantic cod stocks, this practice is still widespread. However, there are small groups of fishermen that continue to operate the more traditional methods of catching ground fish using hooks and line, a technique that has been around for centuries. Bo Gillis is a fisherman based out of Freeport, Nova Scotia, who we met as he was preparing to take his boat out for the day. How long have you been fishing for? I would have started going out with my father at four years old. Four years? Well, just because, you know, everyone wants to hang out with dad, but. Yeah. <laughs> and I've been owning a boat and operating a boat for five years now. Bo uses a technique called bottom long lining, where a series of weighted lines are lowered to the seafloor with hundreds of baited hooks attached to catch fish like haddock, hake, halibut, and cod. As we helped Bo pull up the first of three long lines, it was clear that this method was quite effective at catching species that he was intending to catch, with only a small amount of bycatch. So we have a dogfish here, it's a type of shark, and uh, it's uh, been caught on the line unintentionally. We're looking for haddock and, uh, and cod right now. But the good thing about this method of fishing is that when you catch one of these dogfish, you see these big spines on the back, you gotta watch out, he's trying to get me. The good thing about getting these things on the, on the bottom long line is that they're not dead, they come up alive and you can put them right back in. We're targeting all sorts of different ground fish here. How would you say the ground fish like fishery here in Nova Scotia has changed since you were young, since you started with your dad? Oh, so that's a pretty easy thing to explain. There are no ground fish left. Not for the long line fleet. You have to go farther from land, which requires a bigger boat. The method of choice is now to drag fish with a net. You need to catch mass quantities, put them on the market as a commodity instead of as a food. Men are just really good at catching fish. We just know how to do it. Even though he doesn't catch as much as a dragger, Bo's fish are not bruised and crushed in nets, so he's able to command a higher price for his fish. I don't have 20,000 pounds of them in my boat. I've only got, well, not many today. <laughs> They're easy to care for. They haven't been squished inside a big bag with other fish. It's just a better product. It's cared for a lot better. This is like a dying art. This way of fishing is just not happening very often. So the coastal communities are feeling Oh, impact. my community's gutted. I can take you for a drive in the village and show you all the houses that have been for sale so long, they've rotted and they're worthless now. They're just abandoned houses. There's nothing to do. There's no jobs. 
Coastal communities have been hit hard by overfishing, and Atlantic Canada is the only region in the country with a declining population. Oh, no, it's huge, it's huge. This guy's gonna make my day if I can get him. Dude, it's a nice fish. <laughs> 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 oh, man. Love this job. How much do you say this this one weighs? 50. 50? Yeah. All steak, all power, <laughs> all money. You brought me good luck. I, I think so, yeah. <laughs> the halibut we caught would be worth more than all the other fish we had caught that day combined. Although Atlantic halibut populations have suffered from years of overfishing, Bottom longlining is considered by scientists to be a much more sustainable harvesting method. Once the fish are loaded, they'll be taken to Halifax to be sold at a market by Bo himself through a community-supported fishery program called Off the Hook. All right, well, perfect. Let's, uh, All right. let's finish bringing up this anchor and get on our way. Off the Hook works differently than the typical seafood supply chain by allowing Bo to set the price of his fish himself and sell directly to a group of prearranged customers in the local community. If one guy can go out on a boat and supply all the people who care that much about fish, then we need to change it a little bit so that it takes more than one guy. Because right now the fishery is so depressed that people will not go fishing because they don't earn any money. If we could grow this a little bit, if we could convince people that taking an interest in paying a few dollars more for fish would actually make a difference, then we would find people motivated to go fishing. But right now, it's almost a dead art, long lining. With, with hook and line on bottom, it's very difficult to compete with, with draggermen who, who can catch a lot more fish a lot more efficiently. Bo Gillis is one of the last remaining commercial hook and line fishermen still catching ground fish in Nova Scotia in the least deadly way. But Off the Hook is certainly not the only fishery that has chosen to catch seafood more sustainably. Morning, gentlemen. Today we've come to Canso, Nova Scotia to meet with a group of fishermen who catch shrimp using traps instead of the more destructive method of bottom trawling. It's about 5 a.m., it's cold, it's snowing. We're really excited to see what makes this method of shrimping so special. Fishermen Kevin Horn and Howie Jackson catch shrimp in Chetabucto Bay using modified lobster traps that are placed on the bottom of the ocean and picked up once a day throughout the winter when shrimp come closer to shore. The traps are baited with herring scraps left over from another fishery, and each boat can catch 300 to 1,000 pounds of shrimp per day. And I notice in the, in the traps, I mean, there's no bycatch. I mean, you're only pulling up the, uh, shrimp, the that's shrimp. It. That's it. Once in a while, we'll get a snow crab or a toad crab or something like that, but very, very seldom. But they're still alive when you bring them up, at least, right? Oh, yeah. Just toss them back in and good to go. While this method doesn't catch as much shrimp as bottom trawling, traps have a much smaller impact on the marine environment. Most shrimp are caught by trawling, which has a terrible bycatch issue. So you've seen the pictures probably of, you know, the, the catch of a trawl net and, you know, the, the amount of shrimp, which is the targeted catch, is a small amount, and then skates and rays and sharks and all kinds of other animals are the wasted catch. So these fishermen in Canso, Nova Scotia, Chetabucto Bay, are using a trap. So it's a, it's a selective gear type, which means they're targeting and catching just their catch. And they're using a trap if they're catching something that isn't what they're looking for, they're able to release that back to the ocean without it being wasted. Over 90% of shrimp consumed in North America is imported from bottom trawl fisheries or shrimp farms that have equally destructive impacts. But the high quality and low environmental impact of trap caught shrimp can fetch double the price of shrimp from other sources, making it still profitable for these fishermen, even though they catch less. They're alive when they're caught. They're alive when we bring them on the boat. They'll last sometimes overnight that you can uh, keep the shrimp still, uh, still alive. So you can't get any, any better quality than that. It was inspiring for us to meet fishermen who are so committed to sustainability. But as global populations and demand for seafood continue to grow, 
these more sustainable methods will not always be able to satisfy demand on their own. We have no choice but to find innovative ways to harvest more food from the ocean while reducing our overall impact. One exciting solution is emerging in Connecticut, where we met Bren Smith, a fisherman who chose to completely change the way he harvests seafood. Bren raises shellfish and seaweed in an integrated aquaculture operation he calls 3D farming. Unlike many other aquaculture farms that grow one single species in high volume, Bren's farm works like an ecosystem where each species he grows eats different nutrients found naturally in the water and produces no waste. Imagine an underwater garden, you know, a vertical space where on top here, we've got floating long lines. And from there, we grow our mussels, our scallops, and our seaweeds. And then below that, we've got cages where we have our oysters and clams. On Bren's farm, every level of the water column is used to produce food. The idea is to grow only restorative species, species that require no fresh water, uh, no fertilizer, no land, no animal feed, and grow them all together so it's an ecosystem that's uh, symbiotic and working together. Welcome to seaweed farming. Yeah. Give it a taste. It's nice and it's like sweet. Yeah. Isn't that funny? It is I sweet. It's really tasty. And so our whole idea has been to de sushify our sea greens. We call them sea greens. And we're trying to make kelp the new kale. Because 10 years ago, kale was considered rabbit food. And now it's in every restaurant in New York City. And so if we can have this follow the same trajectory, we actually might move this into a more of a middle class product, people eating it at home. Our kelp is the second fastest growing plant in the world. In this one area, 300 by 300 foot area, I can grow 23 tons of kelp in a couple months. Wow, this is green gold. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Bren Smith was born and raised in Newfoundland and has been fishing all his life, participating in some of the most destructive fishing techniques for the largest industrial fishing corporations that supply the fast food market. While I was out in the Bering Sea back home, the cod crashed. Thousands of people thrown out of work, boats beached, factories empty, and so we, he, there was a whole generation of us who was a split. There were the captains of industry that just wanted to fish the last fish and chase fewer and fewer fish further and further out to sea. But then there was a younger generation that I was part of that we wanted to spend our lives on the ocean. And I want to die on my boat. And um, the short-term strategy just wasn't going to allow that. It's a way of life for us. So I went on a search for sustainability and ended up here. It was a big shift. I have more in common with an arugula farmer now than I do a cod fisherman. Yeah, so you've, you've lost some of the uh, excitement of the high seas yeah. fishing. This is not really the, the deadliest catch out here. Not at all. I call it the least deadliest catch. Yeah. <laughs> we can produce a lot more than food here. We're actually able to produce organic fertilizer. So we have a program with the Yale Sustainable Food Project where they're using our kelp to grow all these wonderful organic vegetables. And we also use it for biofuel. So we can grow our kelp in highly polluted places, like the Bronx, different places. And then take that, not put it into the food chain, but use it for biofuel. Seaweed has tremendous potential as a food and energy source, simply because it requires no inputs and has zero demand on fresh water. And it's filled with all these micronutrients. So seaweeds, some of them have more protein than red meat, more vitamin C than citrus fruits, and more vitamin D than milk. This is our opportunity to eat low on the food chain, extremely low. Eat sea vegetables, eat different crustaceans, because fish don't make all these omega-3s and all these wonderful nutrients we love. They eat them, so by eating what fish eat, we get all the benefits while reducing pressure on fish stocks. One oyster, this oyster right here, filters up to 50 gallons of water a day, pulling nitrogen out of the water column. And nitrogen is something we all need uh, in our bodies, but when it, there's too much in the water, it cre creates dead zones. Mm -hmm. So this little guy is an agent of sustainability. You go over there, that's a dead patch of ocean, and you come here and it's a thriving ecosystem. This is the best fishing now in the whole area because there's just all this structure for fish to come hide, thrive, to eat. And so I'm gonna leave this plot of water when I die in a better place than when I started. 
My view is that 30 years from now, sea vegetables are going to be the most affordable form of food on the planet. So I'm hoping that we can play a big role in feeding the world. Now, not everyone's going to be an ocean vegetarian, but we can be part of the solution to this crisis we're going to face in the coming years. In Asia, seaweed already produces food for millions of people and supports an industry worth over $6 billion. One of the biggest challenges now will be to get the public in North America to buy and cook seaweed themselves. So we headed for New York City to see how seaweed could one day become a staple of our diet. Chef David Santos has worked with Bren to incorporate seaweed into the menu at his Manhattan restaurant, Luro. Hey, David. What's up, guys? Yeah. Hey, got my kelp? Yeah, I got your Fantastic. kelp. Fantastic. Awesome. Hey, Welcome back, man. Yeah. All right. Ready? Let's get in the kitchen. Let's do something. All right, it. let's do it. Fantastic. David has experimented with kelp in a wide range of dishes, and some of his most successful creations have been to simply substitute vegetables with kelp into old recipes, like a kelp chorizo stew and a kimchi and kelp fried rice. But one of the most impressive dishes we tasted used kelp not as a substitute, but as its main ingredient. People are starting to become more health conscious about the pastas. So I thought, well, why not cut ribbons out of the kelp and do a pasta that's not actually pasta, and then the sauce be a fra diavolo sauce which is like something that people recognize yeah. and really like. That's really good. Uh, it's again, it's like you taste, it's when you, you You really notice a cup. Yeah. It, it, it's so funny to me, because it's just like, why aren't we doing this already? Like, I, I why know. Why is it taking so long for? I know, I, I've been the same way. The people who have tried it have all been extremely positive yeah. response, extremely positive response. So I, I don't know why it hasn't really caught on yet. Many of the most important solutions for overfishing already exist. Now it is up to chefs, retailers, and all the people who buy seafood to make the responsible choices. Your spending dollars are actually voting dollars. So you, when you buy, are actually voting for the kind of food you want to see and you want to have in your home. I think that people, when they think fish, think salmon, halibut, cod, trout. and trout. And that's unfortunate. All of us need to diversify our seafood choices and embrace the consumption of marine species that can better withstand human fishing pressure. You know, we're always interested in getting people to move up and down the trophic scale and you know, uh, not always eating top predators. It's healthier, it's, it's healthier for us, it's healthier for the oceans, it's, it's healthier all the way around. Take care. All right, have a great dinner. All right, Take care. thanks. See Good to see you guys. It's just read the label, ask the person selling the fish where it came from. If they can't tell you, don't buy it. Something is destroyed that belongs to us, and I think we need to stand up and say, we don't want this to happen. Uh, we may still want to con consume seafood or not, but if we do, it should be done in a sustainable manner. Simple solutions can work, but there needs to be someone who demands them, and that needs to be us. Our backs are against the wall. We have to figure out strategies of resilience and adaptation, and this is a potential to really think big and create the kind of sustainable economy and sustainable um, food system that we really want. We get to reimagine this, and what a time to live in. Controlling overfishing will be a long and difficult battle. And the first step to solving this problem is to become smarter seafood consumers right here at home. Thankfully, North America is home to some of the highest quality and most sustainable fisheries in the entire world. And there is no reason why we should ever support destructive fishing practices, no matter where we live. So if you want to become a smart seafood consumer, always know where your seafood comes from and how it was caught or grown. And don't be afraid to ask questions and try new things. The ocean is the source of some of the healthiest food on the planet. So let's embrace and celebrate local seafood and do everything that we can to ensure these precious gifts can be enjoyed for generations to come.
Join us and dive deeper into the episodes at thewaterbrothers.ca.